as all our guests have been telling us, as you've been telling us, there is a potential for things to escalate dramatically, not just in the Gaza Strip, but right where you are. Thank you very much, Al Jazeera's Ali Hashem in southern Lebanon. Now, uh, we opened the hour telling you what was happening in Gaza, in southern Israel. We carried the speech out of Washington. We just showed you what's happening at the Lebanon-Israel border. We also want to show you what's happening in the occupied West Bank, because Israel has blocked travel routes inside the occupied West Bank. Imran Khan has this report from Ramallah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going back. I'm going back. Avanti. The occupied West Bank is now not only occupied, it's effectively blockaded. The Israeli army has turned it into an archipelago of separation. You can't leave your home to go visit family or friends in a neighboring area. 3.2 million Palestinians are simply stuck. I left 10 minutes ago. I am sick, but they're not letting me in. This is worse than when we used mules to move around in the old days. Now we can't even get anywhere with cars. Israeli forces have also severely restricted the border with Jordan, the only crossing point for Palestinians who want to travel abroad, leaving thousands stranded. Sahel Khalalia is the head of settlement monitoring at the Applied Research Institute Jerusalem. He specializes in Israel's system of checkpoints and restrictions on Palestinians. The West Bank is surrounded by hundreds of checkpoints, at the border with Egypt, at the Green Line, or within the West Bank. These new restrictions have turned the West Bank into small prisons, and the occupier controls all entries and exits. This is the DCO checkpoint uh, just north of Ramallah. It divides Palestinian territory. Now, the Israelis make it very difficult for Palestinians to normally cross this checkpoint, but now it's impossible. They've just shut it down completely. In the Palestinian town of Huara, this road that runs through it cannot be used by Palestinians. Sometimes the Israelis make exceptions for medical or family emergencies, but even that small concession has now gone. If you're Palestinian and you visited a neighboring area on Saturday, you're now stuck there. Many here feel this effective blockade may not be temporary, that it's simply a precursor to even heavier Israeli restrictions that may well become permanent. Imran Khan, Al Jazeera, Ramallah, the occupied West Bank. Sir Geoffrey Nice joins us from Canterbury, UK. He is Emeritus Gresham Professor of Law. Uh, sir, I had a long list of questions for you, but we just heard the US president. He said a short while ago from the White House, quote, we uphold the rule of law and the laws of war. It matters. There's a difference, end quote. Presumably, he was drawing a distinction between the legality of uh, Hamas's actions, Hamas's attack in Israel, and Israel's attack on the Gaza Strip. Can you help our viewers navigate this? What is legal and not legal in what you've been watching over the last four days? Uh, he may well have been drawing that distinction. And before I come to the specific answer to your question, I was inclined to make this observation. President Biden and Israel could do a great deal for the rule of law if they joined up to the International Criminal Court and allowed that court to investigate the legality both of the occupation to date, bearing in mind the illegality of the war in Israel, and submit peacefully to legal adjudication of what they're doing. It's an unhappy reality that Israel is more or less immune from the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, that America will save it if there's any attempt to refer it there by the Security Council, and that America itself is not a member of that court. As to your specific question, then I think the following has to be accepted. The strike by Hamas is pretty obviously unlawful. They give reasons for it, but I don't think the reasons would merit a defense if challenged in court. The attack by Israel may or may not be justified in part. Defense against the rockets, certainly. Self-defense, already a hard issue from them to advance for several reasons, not just because uh, um, of the overall circumstances, but because 
uh, you defend yourself against a state, and Gaza is not a state. It's also an occupied territory, and it's occupied by Israel. So there's got out the initial problems about the legality of what it's doing, although defending itself against the rockets is undoubtedly legal. The nature of its attack on Gaza is much, much more problematic for it. And the language of the politicians and military leaders is something we must watch with great care. Siege may just about, in certain circumstances, be legal. For example, if the siege is of a territory or a town or an area that is comprised entirely of opposing forces, that is not the case here. And siege brings with it the inevitability of the risk of starvation. It's almost forecast by what is said by Israel. And intentional starvation is now recognized, without any doubt, as an international crime. So the attack by the response attack, let's not use a pejorative term, All right. what Israel is doing is problematic in at least those areas. Sir Jeffrey Nice, again, I, I would have loved for this conversation to last a lot longer. Um, we weren't, hadn't quite forecast the speech and the length of the speech by the U.S. president, but I thank you so much for that invaluable analysis of what is legal, what's not legal, and what's a gray area when it comes to the law of war. And that's it for me, Cyril Vanier. Up next is Emily Angwin at the top of the hour on Al Jazeera. Do stay with us. There is no channel that covers world news like we do. The scale of this camp is like...